Welcome to this first Sunday in the season of Lent. My name is Hilary Chrisley, and I am the pastor of Glendora United Methodist Church. In this season of 40 days that leads to the celebration of Easter, we look for ways to strengthen our relationship with God and with others around us. Sometimes that means we need to let go of things that actually hinder us from growing stronger spiritually. Other times, it means there are ways we can increase our faith, stretch our spirituality, and grow in grace. We offer this time of worship to you as a part of your Lenten journey. May God bless you as we join together in worship. Please join with me in the responsive call to worship. We have started down a road that will take us to the cross. It is a journey we take together and a journey each makes alone. We are invited to notice things on the way, to notice the sharp stones, the uneven ground, the mercy of shade, the faithfulness of those who walk with us. We carry little with us, but that which is in our hearts. Hope, trust, fear, apprehension, wonder, sorrow. On this walk, we rest and sing and pray and listen. In our worship, we rest and sing and pray and listen. Then let us worship God. Lord, move throughout these forty days for 
Our New Testament reading for today is Mark chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. At once the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. We are in a new church season, the season of Lent. It is a season of reflection and of growth. It is a time when we walk with Jesus through some of the most troubling scriptures and events in the Gospels. And each week as we follow Jesus, we will find ourselves where Jesus is, the bustling city, a sunny hillside, in the temple, in the darkness, in Jerusalem. And today we are with him in the wilderness. Let me invite you to be prepared to pause for a few minutes, to breathe, watch, listen, to recall, to imagine the wilderness. Let us be where Jesus is in the wilderness. Let us join together for our reflection for Lent. I just realized that in my imagination, the wilderness is always somewhere else, a foreign landscape I actively have to enter in the act of being faithful. Truthfully, the wilderness is always where I am right now, and faith is the courage to stay with it when I'd rather pretend I'm anywhere else.
Our Old Testament reading for today is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10 through 14. God found Israel in a wild land, in a howling desert wasteland. He protected him, cared for him, watched over him with his very own eye. Like an eagle protecting its nest, hovering over its young, God spread out his wings, took hold of Israel, carried him on his back. The Lord alone led Israel. No foreign God assisted. God made Israel glide over the highlands. He fed him with food from the field, nursed him with honey from a boulder, with oil from a hard rock, curds from the herd, milk from the flock, along with the best of lambs rams from Bashan, he goats too, along with the finest wheat, and for drink, wine from the juiciest grapes. Giving of ourselves is a part of our Christian faith. Giving is not just a duty, but a privilege. Seeing our giving this way transforms our actions of giving from any sense of burden to a joyous expression of faith. It's an opportunity to be part of something greater than oneself, to contribute to the welfare of others around us, and to participate in divine work in the world. Eternal God, we present our offerings to you now as a token of our love for you. We know that our financial giving is not the only thing you require. We remember your mandate to take your gospel to the whole world. We remember that you desire us to love you with all our hearts and our minds and our souls. We remember that you told us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Help us to live your gospel in our love and service. Amen. With the coolness of the waters of the River Jordan on his skin, and the voice of God ringing in his ears and heart, the voice of God calling him beloved, Jesus is equipped. And the writer of our New Testament reading, Mark, always so concise and direct, doesn't tell us all we wish we knew about that time for Jesus, but he does tell us some things. Jesus has what he needs to take a space of time to focus. He has days and days and days set aside to look deeply down into himself and to look daringly up to God. He has some centering to do, some alignment, some preparation, and some planning. And in that course of time in the Judean wilderness, um, among the critters and the herds of goats and scrub brush, Jesus prays and ponders about what is ahead. What will he do with his life? Well, not his life exactly, the life dedicated fully to the way and will of God. Where will the time ahead take him? What shall he say? Who will he meet? Will he go it alone? or will there be those who want to join him? Can't he simply miraculously cure and heal everyone in every village? Can't he simply feed tens of thousands who are hungry? Can't he simply sway the political, social, economic, military powers to see where the true power is? Days and days and days to mull things over and try things on 
and project ahead where he will go and what he will do. There's so much to do, so much needed, so much proclaiming, convincing, inviting that will be needed. So much mercy and forgiveness and healing needed. So much trust and integrity, perseverance and patience needed. So much immediate need to meet. So much stamina for the long haul required. Days and days and days. Jesus was in that space in the wilderness, finding the, the kernel, the core, the gospel of his days ahead. Confirming and strengthening and knowing that it is not about seeking numbers or name recognition or charts or graphs of productivity. It's not about the statistics of satisfied customers or the short term. It's not about the expedient answer. It's not about being religious or going through the motions of piety. Nope, none of these will sustain. None of these will endure. None of these is the way. Days and days and days to consider what shape and form, what wilderness, what boundaries. Days and days and days to center on what can be let go, what can die, and what can be invited into living, thriving, and transforming. And when those days had been accomplished, Jesus came out of the wilderness. Now Jesus may have been able to leave the wilderness, but Jesus didn't leave the wilderness behind. I think Jesus always had a part of those days with him wherever he found himself. And now our scripture writer, Mark, gets a bit more illuminating. Jesus has left the wilderness, has gone home to the region of Galilee, now, if you were headed home after 40 days away with temptation and wild beasts and angels, what would you be likely to say? To tell everyone how hard that 40 days was? How the world is full of scorpions and leopards and bears? That the earth is dry and inhospitable and the sun is too hot and the moon is too cold and, well, well, we know. Now listen to what Mark wants us to be sure to hear, to understand that Jesus' first message after 40 days in the wilderness is this, God's good news. Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. There is good news. God's kingdom is coming on earth as it is in heaven, and it is good news. We still have time to change what we need to change in our lives and in our hearts, and it's good news, and we can trust this good news. Now, it seems to me that we could just stop here and simply be glad that Jesus tells us what we like to hear. Whew, it's all good. God is coming, but we don't have to change things quite yet. No worries, we have time. Or we can consider that the kingdom of God is good news, and the good news is the kingdom of God. Hmm, we may need a little more help on this one. Let's take a look. If you know any Christians, or if you happen to be one, you've probably heard the word gospel as a kind of summary of Christian belief, connected to phrases like, God loves you, or Jesus died for your sins. But over time, religious words like gospel can lose their power and meaning by becoming too familiar. So, let's take a moment to rediscover what this important word, gospel, meant to the people who wrote the Bible. Gospel translates the Old Testament Hebrew verb, biser, and the noun, besora. The Greek New Testament equivalent is euangelion, which is a compound word. Eu means good, and angelion means announcement. All of these words mean good news, but what kind of news? Well, in Hebrew, biser is what we might call national news, or a royal announcement. Like when King David hears a messenger Biser that his army was victorious in battle, that means he still rules on his throne over the people of Israel. And after David dies, his throne is passed on to Solomon, his son. 
And when he was inaugurated as king in Jerusalem, a herald spreads the Besorah, that a new ruler is in charge. But after Solomon's death came a bunch of bad news kings, whose corruption led their nation into self-destruction. This is why the prophet Isaiah announced the good news that one day the God of Israel would come as the cosmic king to confront all corrupt and violent kingdoms and restore his rule over all nations. And so when Jesus of Nazareth hit the public stage, he continued Isaiah's gospel when he went around announcing the euangelion of God's kingdom. Jesus claimed that God was restoring his reign over his people Israel and over all nations, and he was the one bringing it all about. Now, the euangelion about a new king in charge means a new way of life. Jesus said that living in God's kingdom meant following him by putting down the sword and seeking peace through radical forgiveness and generosity, even toward your enemies. His good news required people to make a decision. This is why Jesus took his euangelion to Jerusalem to confront the corrupt and violent kingdoms of his day. But he challenged them in a surprising way with the power of God's generous love. As Jesus was being executed by his enemies, he received his crown and was mocked as a fake king. But he displayed true royal authority by forgiving his tormentors. Jesus was the one in charge that day, giving his life for the sins of others. And then, a few days later, everything changed. Jesus rose from the dead as the true king whose love is stronger than death. He appeared to hundreds of his followers and told them to spread the euangelion, that all authority in heaven and on earth now belongs to him. And they did share this good news all over the ancient world. They did it by writing the four accounts of Jesus' life that are the gospel. That is, they tell the story of how Jesus brought God's kingdom, how he lived for others and died for their sins, and then was raised from the dead. Jesus' followers also shared the good news by simply talking about it. This is why Peter and Paul, or Priscilla and Aquila, traveled all around sharing the royal announcement. While it might look like the rulers of our world are in charge and can do whatever they want, the good news is that the crucified and risen Jesus is the true Lord of the world, the real king of all creation. And in Jesus' kingdom, things are different. It's where the real leaders are the servants, because the last are first and the first go to the back of the line. It's where the hungry are fed and the homeless are welcome, because love is the most powerful reality of God's kingdom. And this good news is not easy to believe. It actually sounds kind of crazy when you first hear it, but something happens when people tell the story of Jesus and start living like he really is the king of the world. That's when this gospel becomes the best news that you've ever heard. It is good news. The good news is the gospel. Come to us in the life of Jesus Christ. But what will that look like in our world? What will that look like in my life if I trust in this good news, this gospel, this Jesus? Let us find out more together as we take this Lenten journey, these days ahead of us, days and days and days. They stretch out before you in the season of Lent. We have a gift from God of a season where we can lean on God more where we get to look deeply into ourselves and daringly up to God. With the waters of our baptism still recent memory and the divine voice echoing in your heart, calling you beloved, you are equipped. You have what you need to go into these days to try on and try out the ways of God and to discover how they will become your way of life. Days and days and days to center, to pray, to ponder. Our life, our love, our longing is to see and hear and know what God is doing and to strip away anything complicating, obstructing us from imitating God's love. To find the kernel, the core, the gospel that is less about sorrow and more about love, less about a victim and more about a victor. It's less about sin and more about transformation. Days and days and days to fill our hearts and minds to prepare ourselves to be changed 
and to open ourselves to the Spirit's gift of this season of Lent. Days and days and days. Thanks be to God. Let us join in our response to the word. Lord, as we struggle each day to discern the bread from the stones, the truth from the fiction, your word from the lies, please help us and guide us and give us your strength. Lord, as we struggle each day to discern the difference between trusting you and testing you, following your word and manipulating it, your ways and our ways, please help us and guide us and give us your strength. Lord, as we wrestle each day to resist the temptation to worship the wrong things, to see through the distractions that confound and confuse us, to overcome the fears that distract and depress us, please help us and guide us and give us your strength. Lord, as we enter this Lent, we seek to follow you, to seek the gospel, to live the gospel. As your disciples, we join in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> When we are born. 
whatever wilderness the Spirit has brought you to, walk in boldness as a beloved child of God. Walk in peace under the shelter of the Most High. Walk in faith, knowing Christ walks with you. Amen.